Hi, welcome everybody Hi. to the September session of the Neglected Books Publisher Spotlight. Uh, this is a real treat. We're going to have uh, uh, David Stromberg, uh, who's been the editor of the uh, Lost Classic series from uh, Modern Times, which is a real uh, new entrant to this uh, uh, special niche area of reissue publishing. Uh, but they've certainly come on in full force. I don't know anybody who else who's come from from zero to 26 books uh, at the speed uh, that they have. So uh, that's a, a remarkable uh, achievement. We're going to focus in particular on uh, this book, which is Babette Deutsch's uh, Mask of Salinas. This is her um, third novel, third or fourth novel. And we're also very privileged to have with us Benjamin Yarmolinsky, who is uh, one of Babette Deutsch's uh, grandsons. So uh, we may have an opportunity to talk about uh, her life and her work as well. Uh, but I want to start with uh, just a little overview of um, the book and a little background on, on Babette Deutsch. And then we'll also, uh, I want to highlight just personally some of the titles that I find particularly interesting in the first batch that have come out from uh, Lost Classics. And then we'll have a discussion with David about the uh, about the series, about the press, his vision, what's coming up. Um, and uh, then we'll have an opportunity for folks to ask questions and engage in a discussion about the book, the series, et cetera, and neglected books and period uh, in, um, in general. So uh, if you'll... Bear with me for a moment. So this is the September session. We've been doing these since uh, January. And very unfortunately, we had to cancel our January session because uh, uh, we were going to focus on Dean Street Press has done a fabulous job with a lot of British women writers. But unfortunately, there were uh, first the, the publisher's wife died in January and then the publisher himself, Rupert Heath, uh, died a couple of months later. So we haven't been able to catch up with them. Um, so today we're going to be talking about this book in particular, Mask of Salinas. As I mentioned, uh, it came out, uh, it was the, her third novel, uh, came out in 1933. Uh, and I think it's important, and hopefully we can talk about that today. It, I think it's important to remember the context in which this book came out, because it is really more than just a historical novel about the trial and death of Socrates. It really is also, you have to kind of always think about that in the context of what was happening at that time uh, in terms of free speech, uh, ideas about democracy, and also the fact that many of these are questions and issues we're still dealing with today, unfortunately. So Babette Deutsch, uh, uh, born just at the, uh, before the turn of the century, lived to 1982. Probably best known uh, if you if people remember her today, it's probably for two reasons. Number one, she was a, a prolific poet and uh, sort of coming out of the modernist trend, but took it much uh, further. And she had a really a, a rich uh foundation in essentially the the full historical context of poetry and so you'll see classical influences in her work as well and the other thing is that uh many of us uh recall dealing with her handbook to poetry um uh, as kind of a basic text if you were taking undergraduate uh, english uh uh and and talking about poetry so she she also did a lot of work at criticism uh, over her career. She did write four novels. The first one of these, which uh, I, I knew of, but honestly I hadn't read the write-up until I um, uh, prepared this talk, but this sounds like a really fascinating one, Brittle Heaven, uh, which is sounds from uh, in most consensus is it, uh, fairly autobiographical and also very much the perspective of a woman coming up at the turn of the century to the 20s, dealing with motherhood, dealing with uh, trying to establish career, which are you know, topics that are continue of interest to uh, women in particular. Uh, her second novel, In Such a Night, 
uh, it seems to me to have, uh, I actually have a copy of this, so I haven't read it, um, have a lot of parallels with another novel that came out just a little bit later than this, um, Tess Lessinger's The Unpossessed. So it's very much about the kind of very lively intellectual and political world that was going on in the jazz age, New York, and also some of the consequent dissip dissipation that was going on because uh, uh, as, as in fact, I just recently finished reading a book by uh, Donald Freed, who was one of the partners in, in Boney Live Right, and then Kovici Freed, which was a big publisher of a lot of important writers of that time. And in, in hindsight, he says that essentially that the number one sport of the 1920s was alcoholism. Uh, and so that's sort of a factor in this book as well. And then finally, her fourth novel, uh, Rogue's Legacy, which was uh, also a historical novel about uh, Francois Villon, uh, the famous uh, uh, balladeer poet uh, of the French Middle Ages. Uh, and actually, uh, those two books, Rogue's Legacy and Mask of Salinas, are both available from Lost Classics, as is a collection of her criticism, uh, Potable Gold. Um, and I have to say, David, tribute to you, not many people will take the risk of reissuing uh, criticism that's, you know, more than a, a couple of years back, uh, which is unfortunate because obviously, um, you know, other than the big names like uh, Walter Benjamin, um, you know, criticism has always has been a legitimate form that develops over the course of time. And, uh, you know, the fact that it was written a few decades ago never invalidates it, in my opinion, anyway. I also wanted to take a time to uh, just notice notes, as I mentioned, modern times, uh, um, I correct me if I'm wrong, David, but uh, just kind of hit the street uh, within the last uh, six to nine months. Uh, and so it's uh, pretty astonishing to see the list that they've been able to uh, put together uh, uh, and, and hit the street with uh, this kind of rich. Uh, and I think one of the things I like about this uh, list is the diversity you see. So you have everything from the 20s. So some, some of this stuff is currently in public domain, and there's always an issue about uh, reissuing public domain. But then it goes all the way up to uh, the 70s and 80s with uh, Shulamith Harvin. A couple I wanted to note in particular, Francis Newman, who's a fascinating uh, author, died very young, um, and uh, but put two novels with two of the best titles ever, uh, The Hard-Boiled <laughs> Version and, and uh, Dead Lovers Are Faithful Lovers. Uh, she was very much of this tradition a number of other writers who uh, are, are also kind of worthy of rediscovery, like Issa Glenn, came from this uh, Southern feminist satirical background, breaking away from the kind of antebellum South conventions that you see reflected, you know, most notably in Gone with the Wind, the sort of uh, mythologizing of the his the heroism of the Confederacy, whereas Francis Newman and Issa Glenn and a few others of that time, uh, and Goodwin Winslow is another one, were definitely saying, "Well, it wasn't it wasn't all hunky dory. It wasn't all wonderful." Um, and there's a lot to be uh, criticized in this culture that we came from. And of course, it, that meant that they incurred incurred some backlash from from people of their own society. Uh, another one kind of in the same ilk is uh, Grace Lumpkin, A Sign for Cain, which I think was her second novel um, and uh, deals with race issues. This is particularly interesting. There's been a relatively recent book uh, from, I think about two years ago, Jacqueline uh, Dowd Hall's Sisters and Rebels, which looks at three Lumpkin, actually all three Lumpkin sisters were writers and political activists. So uh, at, at the time, really from the 20s through, uh, in the case of um, Grace Lumpkin, even all uh, all the way through into uh, the M McCarthy era. Uh, so that's a particularly interesting title to see being brought back. And then finally, uh, David mentioned this briefly, 
in the beginning, but uh, Many Are Called, which is a, a collection of uh, short stories by Edward Newhouse. Edward Newhouse sort of started as a radical writer in the early 30s, wrote a number of novels that were about the, the downtrodden, uh, about the labor movement, about unemployment. Uh, and then he kind of hit his stride as a short story writer, wrote many novel uh, uh, short stories for the New Yorker, and actually, I think, shared a, uh, lived in the same apartment building as John Ch Cheever at one point, uh, and was a terrific writer. He actually stopped writing for perhaps the best reason of all, which was uh, he married a wealthy woman <laughs> and no longer financially needed to write, and so he stopped. Uh, uh, so uh, this is this is a, he wrote a couple of novels after this collection came out, uh, but by the uh, mid '50s he had stopped writing completely, which is a shame. And I'm very happy to see these these stories back in print because I think they're among some of the best that came out of the New York New Yorker school. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop. What when we come back at the end, we'll talk about what's coming up uh, for the next a uh, few months in this series and then also look forward to next year when we're going to be doing an interesting exercise of uh, uh, reading uh, very short books. Uh -huh. So with yeah. that, let me uh, turn it over to uh, invite David to, to kind of give us some uh, talk about uh, the background of how, how Lost Classics came together and uh, uh, how you put this collection together, and also where you see uh, the collection going. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the end. I'll say that um, we have Grace Lumpkin's other uh, novels on the way now, and also one of Edward Newhouse's other novels, um, You Can't Sleep Here. Um, oh, yeah. And I was excited that I actually got a, a young writer who wrote on the topic of writers in... Um, in uh, in the 30s, um, Jason Boog, he's going to, or Boog, I don't know. Oh, yeah, he wrote, yeah, let me just mention, jump in. Yeah, Jason, yeah. Um, I, I forget the name of his book, but um, um, he, he published a book about four years ago, I want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's and, looking uh, at a number of the writers who were writing about the challenges of dealing with the tough economic situation facing everybody, but writers in particular, uh, in the 1930s. And it spotlights uh, a number of uh, really good writers from the 1930s who were publishing at that time and trying to and, and dealing with this issue. And actually, there's, there's a few others in there that uh, would be nice to see uh, brought back as well. So that that's really great. That's the first thing I thought when you uh, when you mentioned that title. Cool. So it's so he's going to. I'm just writing. Um, um, there's an echo, and I think I know where it's coming from. So I'm just going to write to the person. Yeah. If um, you're not uh, participating, just go on mute because these things are very echo sensitive. Um, so, so I, yeah, I contacted him because I was looking for information on the book and 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 I saw that and he and I, I think he agreed. So I'm I'm excited about that. Um and um so those so that's kind of starting at the end. And um basically, well, so we've been we've been working for longer than six to nine months. It would be nice to have 30 almost 30 books, because we have also the periodics. Um it would be nice to have almost 30 books within nine, six or nine months. It's been almost two years, meaning at the beginning of last year, basically, we started at the beginning of 2022. Although the thinking about it uh, started much, I would say, a couple of years before that. And even that was a kind of development of a small press that I had when I was an undergraduate and 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 a master's and MFA student um, almost 20 years ago at this point. Um, and that press fell apart out of just youth and stupidity. And um, um, I, I, <laughs> I didn't have any money, but I did. I, but I took all of the cash that, that I was given uh, for my student loans for grad school and put it into the press. And then and then the printer 
stole it. <laughs> so I had <laughs> and I had an author out um on a book tour without a book and you know, it was and and a, and a distributor that I had no books to sell and it was it was a, it was a real mess. So I was very um hesitant to go back uh to ever publishing <laughs> again. <laughs> right. Um and then I worked for Penguin after that and and I just saw that things had changed in the publishing industry so much. Um over the years, I was I was at Penguin. And I worked production, so I've, I've always kind of been interested in how books are created and produced. And I was there when they first started what was then called short run printing, uh, mm-hmm. which you can make maybe fifty books, and they looked horrible. And I was very angry about the with 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 the VP, you know, kind of fighting for a better quality. But the but the kind of technology that we have today with POD just wasn't wasn't there in two thousand six, two thousand eight. Um, so, so things kind of quieted down. I went to do a doctorate, et cetera. Um, and then I started working with the, uh, essentially what became the Isaac Bashev Singer Trust and with their agent, which is, uh, Susan Schulman. And through our work together, I discovered that she had, um, a kind of a publishing arm, but that publishing arm was mostly reissuing uh, out of print books by her clients as a service to them, essentially. Um, and so we started talking about how to um, create a kind of a literary imprint. And I looked back and again, I thought about my days in, in book production and Penguin, and it would be surprising. It, it, for me, it was surprising as a 26, 27 year old sitting in these big production meetings with operations with editorial with art etc and deciding okay we we sold a hundred copies of x book last year should we reprint we sold 50 copies of x book and you're you think it to yourself penguin <laughs> group usa is deciding whether to print a hundred books you know it's, it mm-hmm. became kind of um an interesting and strange exercise uh, in understanding the, the the foundation of publishing and so as I started thinking about about publishing again, um, I said to myself, "Well, you, you know, the publisher needs um, a backlist. Essentially, everything's everything's about the backlist." By that time, though, I was I was publishing, and I always say publishing for me is a compulsion more than anything else. Um, and by that point, I'd been doing research and 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 writing scholarly articles, etc., uh, and books. Um, and I was I got interested in um, in this sort of interwar period. Um, when I started the books of Shulamit Revan and and also um, Lay Brochman, which were the first books, were essentially um, pilots. It was just can, can I do this? Can I physically go through the process, get the book up, make it work? And it did. Um, and those were people that I sort of people who I knew uh, who are rights to whom to which I could get relatively quickly and also people who would trust me <laughs> to, reach, <laughs> to reach these books without any without a publishing company you know right um one of them is Gail Revan who's who's Shulamita Revan's daughter and she's also a writer and basically she was one of the authors I was supposed to publish in the press that fell apart 20 years ago um and I ended up bringing her novel to uh, to Melville House, who then published it, and then she won the first ever Best Translated Book Award. So, you know, and she's and she's a friend, so she she trusted me um, with the process. So that was nice. Um, and then I started putting together public domain sort of collections that didn't exist. So I brought these, um, the two that I'm kind of proud of are, are these two, mm-hmm. um, the Jewish Problem and the New Puritanism. This this is this is a this is a title that actually exists under which Emma Lazarus wrote her. Um, I say this, there's no actual title like this that Mencken has, but I uh, gave it uh, that title and I created a sort of a little volume bringing together his thinking on on this issue, which I think is extremely important and never endingly relevant in American society. Um, and it developed, it developed, I was doing some writing of my own, et cetera, I came across uh, Louis Adamich, pronounced Adamich in America, but I, I can't help myself, so I call him Adamich. <laughs> um, and and I ended up finding this little book. I don't know if 
if that comes off. Oh yeah, the truth about Los Angeles. Right. So this was this 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 work was essentially a reissue of part of um, what was called Little Blue Books. Right. Um, right. And it was put together. It's pretty cool. It's put together by a um, cultural center in Slovenia, where Adam. Oh just wow! Went. Yes. Yeah, because uh, Louis Adamich was a, a Slovenian writer. In fact, he, he wrote about going back. Of course, in those days, it was called Yugoslavia. It was yeah. So here, first for example, the back inside flap has Louis Adamich's suit worn during his return visit to Yugoslavia, kept by um, one of the municipalities in the memorial room in Trapoce. And here's a picture of his suit. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that was nice and it was interesting, but and it was the only thing you could get in print by him. Right. Um, and I was interested in it partly because I grew up in Los Angeles and I wanted to know the truth about it. Um, yeah. And and so I ordered that um, from them directly, you know, from this, they had to say, you know, do we have any copies from this little cultural center? Um, right. And so... And so the and the books grew, and 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 then I I kind of hit hit a groove. It, the first few took a while, but then I hit a groove because I really understood what I was looking for, understood which writers I was looking for. It's true that you know there's a combination of public domain and also um, when I find authors for whom um, heirs or or executors exist, and I can track them down, and then I can get them to trust me. Um, that, that I do get um, um, get try to get right, you know, permission to right. to do that. Um, and that was was the case in with Babette Deutsch and 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 now Ben Ermolinsky is is also with us, which is exciting. Um, and I got a chance to meet him when I was in New York in March, and that was you know probably I don't even know at this point, but six months or a year after we had been um, uh, corresponding by email. And um, and there's a bunch more. There's another batch coming through now, um, cool. literally in production. And the other half of that is periodics, which which in it, in in intention is meant to be, hopefully at some point, equally new and old mm -hmm. publication periodicals. Um, I think that it could be a really interesting platform for, especially for online, your small online journals to right. be able to um, sort of feature, look back and feature what they've done over the past X years. Um, right. James WW happens to have done that up to about 10 or 15 years ago, and then they hadn't done the last decade. So we kind of fit. Um, well, there are also one of the interesting things I find is in, in this period, there were a number of, of really exciting anthologies that came out, like Alfred Kramberg did uh, two enormous anthologies called The American Caravan. And this year, actually, I've been reading my way through another one called 365 Days that Kate Boyle and her husband, Lawrence Vail, put together, where it's it's really a collection of flash fictions uh -huh. uh, inspired by newspaper headlines from 1934. And it's a fabulous collection, but like any anthology, you know, some of the, some of the pieces really are timeless and some of them are just trash. <laughs> and, you know, they, they cry out for somebody to pick, pick the, you know, the golden right. nuggets from that and repackage it. Uh, so in a then, way that so like for example the smart set I that's what I did the smart set anthology I went back I looked at the anthologies because so many had been created and they're you know big anthologies and I said yeah, okay how right. can you make something that will allow and also you know also to go back to Babette Deutsch I personally am much more comfortable in prose than I am in in poetry though I find myself always especially interested in the prose of poets <laughs> Right. Um, and so and so I was interested in, in her work. So when I'm looking at these older anthologies like the smart set, um, I, I take out the poetry, the the, the, dra the drama, the, the sort of 
these sort of one act plays that were used as as a as a particular kind of genre, which is you know dialogue, which is far less. Which, by the way, her was her first publication in in the first ever New Masses. Oh yeah. Speaking of, I I have to plug this. I'm for it, but since we're on this topic, this is a book that I helped. Uh, bring out these are this is going on sale the end of this week it's called uh, to test the joy selected poetry and prose by uh, Genevieve Taggart who uh, was involved in fact created an anthology out of new masses yes uh, and the liberator and was very much in the middle of that whole scene in New York in the 20s and 30s I'm really particularly proud of this one because Taggart died in 1948. She's an amazing writer, never had a single collection republished since her death. Wow. So this is like, you know, a hugely important writer from that time. And this is the first thing coming out. I mean, I'm glad we're bringing it out, but it's a shame that it took this long to get her work kind of back. And this is a collection of both. It's a poetry, it's memoir, it's criticism, and uh, also short stories, because she was quite a versatile. So so like Bebo Deutsch, I mean, she was capable of writing in a variety of forms. And I was just researching her today. So that's, (laughs) I was just looking at her and just read your article about her also. Yeah. Um, Oh, I was so excited we were able to bring her stuff back together. Uh, And that is a case where we still had to work out uh, uh, an arrangement with the estate because most of her stuff is still under copyright. So that, you know, so we do that when we can. We had one case of someone like Toshio Mori who, uh, whose son gave gave us the right and then he gave us the okay to start the next one by the time I got the the um, uh, the, our, the contract to him, he was, he didn't answer me and then it turned out he had, was sick and, and had passed away. So you know, it can it can be very um, tricky. Uh, similar thing happened with Frederick Prokosch, although now we've managed to uh, to work that out. So that's also coming, and that's very exciting. Um, what are, What are you bringing out from uh, Prokosch? Because he's been off the radar for a um, long time. I love the cave and 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 the Musulongi file. Oh, okay. To so and 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 one of them will have actually um we're going to use I found in in, in at Isaac Bashevis Singer's archive a kind of article that he wrote about the Musulungi archive uh, file and so we're going to use that as an afterword and I oh, wrote cool. to someone else wrote about him so you know we we work it out when we can but I would say for you know it's it's a very personal project and it really comes from a place of um kind of looking to it's called so the series is called lost canons and 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 the reason is that the original title or the original idea for the name of the of the series was was loose canons (laughs) which you know about it's a good joke but do you want to carry it around for years (laughs) exactly exactly we can we can we can really enjoy it on on a on a zoom conversation but you don't want on that on every single book forever um so so i settled on lost canons but part of the feeling especially with covid um was you know looking for an intellectual community that was from a different time Mm -hmm. and and so and so by focusing on that it wasn't just a question of what was neglected but rather what was lost and what was lost to our to our kind of collective unconscious it was into our collective unconscious and and particularly the issue of neglect is is i feel very deep here because part of the part of the um interesting aspect of finding these books has to do with copyright and has to do with um copyright renewal right so there's a there was a there's right. a law that anything published between 95 years ago and 1963 that wasn't uh renewed is in public domain of course those there there are these companies like this was a, the mistake that I, a, a slip of the tongue that i made when we first got in contact with like forgotten books and many others 
that that go back 95 years and just put everything through. They just harvest, yeah. They don't do the research, right? They're not actually interested in particular authors. So they're not going to go and see, well, was the hard-boiled virgin uh, renewed? <laughs> you know, and if not, then then let's 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 reissue it, right? And they're not looking at the author and they're not looking into what happened. By the way, hard hardboiled virgin sells at least a copy a month or two. And I'm just wondering like who is who is ordering this book? You know? Mm -hmm. Um it's very it's it's one of the ones that have, that just comes up every single time. Um so so one of the questions that came that came up for me and and I and I've been very curious about is if you look at the biographies of the writers then usually the ones who don't renew are also ones who were somehow not not only right but many of the ones who haven't renewed were involved in uh progressive socialist communist absolutely um um causes and by the time it came you know by the 28th year when they had to renew either their lives were in different places or they just I am I, I'm projecting but they probably just felt like what's the point yeah right it wasn't on their radar right they weren't right. still in the game to such a degree that they were that they were making sure that their works were protected right well this was the case actually our our first uh reissue from uh, recovered books was a book called gentleman overboard by a writer named uh herbert clyde lewis who despite his name uh was a brooklyn jew uh parents came from from russia uh deliberate his, his parents had three kids and they he deliberate they deliberately anglicized and christianized their son's name so that they uh, uh, can essentially uh not be assumed to be jewish but uh um, he was blacklisted and lost work, and he died of a heart attack when he was 43, I think, 41. And um, his wife, uh, his widow, didn't think, you know, you know, who's who's gonna? His books are out of print. Nobody's ever gonna want these again. So, uh, gentleman overboard was in the public domain, uh, but nobody had noticed it, you know. Well, that so that was that was going to be. I didn't want to say it, but or or they died, right? That yeah. The <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not laughing about their death, in, of course. That was that was the case in, in in the case of Fanny Cook, who's we're also going to be doing uh, some of her other books. Uh, she's a very interesting. Also, happens to be a a, a southern a German Jewish writer from the south, um, and and. And so that that's really where where the project settled. I would say in the beginning it was it was pretty ambiguous. You know, I was going it was it was parallel to to what I was researching essentially. As I was researching researching things, I would find these names, find these authors, look into them, find you know, and then put them in. So most of them have published in the New Masses because I found them while doing uh, the New Masses anthology, or most of them published in Common Ground, which was edited by Louis Adamage. Um, uh, at first, not only him by him, but at first, and and so and that's why I found them. So, so that's that's really, you know. And then you find, and then it's, there's there's a kind of a, I don't know how, how you find your books, which are there's, you know, so many that you that you found, but you kind of somehow you fall into this loop of of um, of connections. You know, you find this yeah, connection. absolutely, absolutely. And suddenly you. Um, what was it? I was looking at a, a one of your one of your um, pieces. One of the books that I was looking at came up in your article, which was maybe um, Lionel Trilling's wife. Oh, Diana and, Trilling. Yeah, right. Had she? Was it her? She had written a whole series of of reviews. Yeah. Uh, we, oh, yes. Um, what was the name of that collection? It came out in the eighties and it was a collection of her book reviews. And, and what you, I did was I, I called, I went through that and essentially said, yeah. if I've never heard of this book, let me look into it. And right. then I, I essentially uh, 
you know, gathered together. And that's that's one of the ways, you know, I do that is just look at, you know, have I heard of this? I mean, and and like the anthologies, you know, go through the table content of an anthology and say, I don't recognize this name. Who were, you know, who was this person? What did they write? What else did they write? Did they write anything else? I mean, sometimes you find an amazing piece and that's it. I mean, Ida Treat is another person who's interesting, you know, and 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 Ida Treat is an example of someone, if you look back and you and and um um and you look back at um um whoa, I'm gonna forget I'm I'm blanking out. Um Mr. Sean is the only person that comes to mind the um the New Yorker. Um you know, greatest editor. Um, uh, oh, um, uh, William Shaw. William Shaw. I don't know. I just, I, I get it. They, yeah, because they, he he and his son both start with W. I get my 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 brain gets confused. But um, um, William Sean was started his kind of role, one of his main roles as a, as someone who was um, responsible for. The writing that was coming out of Europe during World War II, um, and so he was he was editing and bringing in Ida Treat, um, and he's quoted in in her obituary. Um, so she's someone who um, also fell off the map, and and I'm now working on bringing out. This is from for another series that that's going to start. In the next months, hopefully, it's called archivals, and it's it's more based on archival material or things that have never been collected before. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, one of the first ones is going to be um, her New Yorker pieces. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Which 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 have never been collected. Uh, wow. There's another author that's net from from a smart set that's never been collected anywhere ever. Like basically a, a totally unknown female. She I just read um lived in france and came back to, to america she never left america she was a jewish american author uh, basically totally off off the radar I'll, I'll keep her name a surprise for now um she's also coming up another couple of 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 our of of titles like that and this is all again part of part of you know an attempt to widen the intellectual community, the literary kind of the understanding of what it means to have a literary life, mm -hmm. of what it means to have expectations about a literary life, and um, and well, just to to, it, to it, jump I, in, I was just gonna say it's it's a kind of um, it's an exercise it's an exercise in humility, really, is what yeah, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, uh, I uh, there's a terrific book uh, out, uh, came out a, about three years ago called Ascent to Glory, which is about, um, uh, it's by a, a guy, he's actually a sociologist named Alvaro Santana Acuna, and uh, I had a chance to talk to him and, and publish the conversation on my site. And in his book, he argues that there's a difference between classics and canons. And mm -hmm. the distinction, he says, is that, you know, there are classics are essentially self-supporting. And an example is Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. Now, no self-respecting academic is going to write about The Prophet. And yet, it sells hundreds or a thousand plus copies year in, year out, and has for decades. So it's sort of self-sustaining. Uh, uh, and 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is who he focuses on that book and how did it come to be you know, so widely accepted. But he also looks at what he calls counterfactuals, which is the books that did, you know, could have but didn't get the same sort of traction and he distinguishes between classics, which have that sort of self-sustaining aspect, and the canon, which needs curation. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to take care of putting it out, 
you know, make putting it in print. And and I, I'm excited to hear about the archival because one of the reasons I got into publishing some of these books that I've written about is when I had discussions with academics about, well, what about Gertrude Trevelyan, for example, who's a writer that I've championed? Um, you know, well, her books are not only out of print, but virtually impossible to obtain. I mean, some of these right. books are so obscure that uh, if they're British books, the only places you'll find them is what they call their registry libraries, which is the British Library, the National Library of Scotland, and it used to be in the past, the Trinity College Library in Dublin. Those are it. Well, it's actually the, an exceptionally rare academic who go to the effort <laughs> of going to the place where the book physically resides and reading it and then writing some article about it. And there's also sort of this barrier of entry in the academic publishing world, which is there's a real reluctance to publish articles about something. You know, er academics are more than happy to be the second person to publish. Right. It's true. But not yeah. the first, not the icebreaker. Yeah. yeah. You never want to be the first because then you, you and you can't and by it. simply making the darn book available for you know one click buying on whatever platform that you want has such an extraordinary importance. Agreed. In terms of encouraging that idea that 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 the canon, and I think this is where we're both singing from the same sheet of music, which is, you know, literature is a whole landscape of work. It's not just the expressways. It's not right. just Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, William Faulkner, and Shakespeare. You know, and uh, so it's Very it's much. all of these yeah. other people who were around them. You know, James Oppenheim, for example, was a figure I'm yeah. very, very interested in. Um, so he's his books, some of them have been put up on these on on uh, what do you call it, Gutenberg, etc. So so the the I call you call them the um, what the harvesting companies. I call them the bottom feeders. Um, they've they've redone it. But Doctor Arast, for example, exists in some. You know, I went to the New York Public Library and it was a copy with no cover. It all the pages were falling apart. As I moved through it, I, and I basically scanned it there and created the new copy. You know, this is a book which not yeah, only, right. same with Ida Treat. I mean, these are books that, that but Ida Treat was, was in an okay state. I mean, this is a book that was literally falling apart in my hands as I was scanning it. And I was, as I was opening the binding, it's like, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> Here's what I got from Interlibrary Loan. You know, this is a good one. It's got that telltale thick green all yeah. the spine together. <laughs> and I'm and I, and I always say I'm not concerned about breaking the spine because I'm going to give this book a new life. You know, it's going right. it's going to be okay. Um and and some you know sometimes I, I I have to do a little bit of even I mean I don't damage the book at the library obviously but when I get a book myself even if it's old and if I can't get clear enough um images I will take the book apart you know mm -hmm. take Finding off, use an exacto knife and 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 um, and basically, you know, create the pages so I can. Right. And that comes from 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 book production where where you're not as worried about that <laughs> um, that aspect of the process. Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, take a moment and uh, pull back. We've gotten into uh, the list. Uh... But let's let's take a moment to talk about the mask of Salinas in particular, and, and especially since which... we just got back from Athens yesterday. So this is really oh wow! <laughs> and did you get your number? Or they're 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 queuing to the Acropolis now, aren't they? Uh, well, we were, we had an Acropolis view. We didn't go. We were, we were with our three daughters, who are four, two and a half, <laughs> and one. So we we didn't take the Acropolis on ourselves. It seemed like. We've been before, so um, right. We just saw it from the window of our apartment, which was very nice. Okay, so let's talk about this. What what attracted you uh, to this uh, uh, to to republish this? I mean, again, you know, first I'm interested in 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 the, in the prose of of poets in general, um, and I'm very very interested in in Socrates and uh, as a figure and and in the Platonic dialogues I've written about them. Both in my 
in my scholarly work, I've written about it, I wouldn't say extensively, but relatively deeply um, in narrative faith, which was which was my first uh, monograph on Dostoevsky, Camus, and Singer, and 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 talking about the dialogic uh, element as being rooted in Plato. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in in the second book, the second monograph, which is called Idiot Love, and that really looked at um, parallels between Plato and Melanie Klein, structural structural and um, conceptual parallels. Um, and and in general, you know, I found uh, the Platonic dialogues just I don't know, unbelievable. Um, and unbelievable specifically in in the complexity of their reading. Um, mm-hmm. I've had conversations with philosopher, acad- real, you know, scholars and academics who call themselves philosophers. Um, and, and some of them will absolutely not um, allow for a consideration, for a serious consideration of the um, literary elements of the dialogues. Um, mm. It is philosophy. It is ideas. This is what you do with it. Um, and I, I was very, very specifically interested in precisely the literary elements, which have been written about by others. But but it's a debate that can that just does never gets resolved. Um, and specifically going back, I, w- I had written one specific article, um, which talked about aesthetic intention or artistic intention, um, and using just etymology, I found the equivalent word. I was looking for essentially to see whether whether Plato ever used a word like intention um, in in his dialogues, which, and, and, the, and, the, and the place that he did it was, was um, uh, in in the death of Socrates, where he where he talks about um, um, putting fables into in, putting Aesop's fables into verse, and and that's the word that he uses there. So, so this was a topic that was extremely interesting to me. Then, you know, I'm looking into these different authors, and I find this, you know, woman Babette Deutsch. Uh, I start looking into her work. I see that she translated from Russian. So I also translate from Russian. So that's interesting. I see that she wrote an article, you know, at, 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 at a relatively young age, a novel about Socrates. And and I say to myself, you know, wow. <laughs> I mean, who who is this person who has the intellect and the integrity and the vision uh, and the wisdom to sit down in the thirties and 30s, the daring and the daring in the thirties, um, especially what I, I think is important about this is it's not written as a historical novel. No, it's really a resetting of. So it's not looking backwards. It's simply taking that historical moment and retelling it like a fresh story, and. The person, the only person who did this actually, and this is another one of my, was um, Roberto Rossellini has a film um, about Socrates. One of his, he did a, a series of like television films, um, and it's one of the most powerful. And it's it's very similar, right? In both in its timeline, the timeline that it covers, and the events mm-hmm. that it covers. It also opens with with a scene with him coming home and his wife. Um, complaining to him it's extremely similarly structured um and and so you know it was very but of course it was hard to get a copy i did find one copy in israel it was at at, at, in beersheba so i did an interlibrary loan got the copy scanned it and worked from that found uh then uh i don't know if he felt it that way but begged him to (laughs) To allow me to <laughs> to do this because I felt like it was such an important uh, uh, topic, and you know I didn't write a preface for that. I don't write usually prefaces for all of them. So when I collect some, when I when I create a synthetic collection, I do write one. Right. For for reissues, I don't usually write one. I do all the copy anyway. 
Um, but if I were to write one, it would it would it would say something. It would start with like, "There's no pure literary act than you know writing or rewriting the story of Socrates." You know, this that is, or no, maybe I would say no more, no pure modern literary act. <laughs> Um, I just think that for me, this topic, this story, the issues involved are the essence of everything. Right. Um, not just of being human, but being a human living in a particular time, in a particular place, within particular social, cultural, political pressures, and uh, trying not so much to live the good life, but to live a life of truth. Right, right. And particularly, I mean, the martyrdom of Socrates has such lasting, you know, symbolic value for us to say that, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's really kind of, you know, Socrates, Christ, and a few others um, are these examples of, you know, sacrificing everything for the sake of the message. For the sake of, of integrity, meaning being honest with oneself, really. Yeah, you know, right. For the sake of saying, I'm not going to do what I don't believe in because the world has turned. Um, and so it's about totalitarianism, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Let, let's open it up if we can. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't. I mean, this is a wonderful conversation. I am. I'm, I'm so glad you're. Uh, we, we've uh, adjusted the time, so uh, this works yeah. for for you from your end. But uh, since we have uh, uh, Benjamin Yarmolinsky here, uh, I, I just want to take uh, take a few moments to you know to talk about Babe Deutsch uh, uh, and her her kind of her career and 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 where this piece worked uh, fits within her life and uh, any you know perspectives Benjamin that you have about seeing this book finally come back after gosh 80 or 90 years now actually isn't it well first of all I, I want to say I'm very grateful to David for doing this and um, I couldn't be happier that that it's happening uh, but I, I'm not an expert on my grandmother's career, so I, I don't know really what I can tell you. <laughs> How many grandkids are? <laughs> um, I do know that uh, she had, um, I, I guess, a sort of um, <clears throat> successful career as a poet, which was a rare thing. Uh, she was the poet laureate of the United States, for example, which is a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was in the 60s. Um, but uh, like most uh, poets and literary people, uh, uh, she had a, a fading away. Uh, and I'm sure she would be gratified if she if she knew, but that's about all I can say. Okay. Unless you have a specific question. Uh, did she ever, I mean, did, did she ever seem to, uh, in, in the later years, uh, because... I think her last book was published, uh, last books were published in the 70s. Did she ever have regrets or seem to feel like a sense that, that she was aware of her own falling off? Uh, well, I don't think she was so concerned with that as she got older. She was more concerned with getting through the day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, she must have been aware of it. And uh she was a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and that was, I think, gratifying to her. She would go to those events. And um, she had a few literary friends, fewer and fewer as she got older. Right. Um, they would come and visit and talk. She was great friends with Sophie Wilkins, who was translator of uh, The Man Without Qualities. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah. And also with, of Thomas Bernhardt's uh, um, The Correction or Corrections, yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. I have actually an amazing, amazing letter by Sophie Wilkins. I didn't know her. She must have been a very intense person. Um, I found that in the archives in um in Austin when I was in Austin, where she basically ransom center. At the ransom center, yeah. And and she just, you know, that letter I've always wanted to somehow get published. It's it's essentially a manifesto for the rights of translators. Oh Uh wow. And she just she just goes at it. She says, you know, I'm translating Thomas Bernhardt. Like, you know, I have to go into his mind. It's, 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 what do you want from me? Yeah. You know, yeah. how can you pay me so little? How can you give me no royalties yeah. on, on, on a work that is essentially bending my, my brain? <laughs> <laughs> that I, I have to say, there is such an appetite, you know, the, the role and the rights of translators are being recognized now in a way that that's never happened, I don't think. And uh, that that would be so valuable and so appreciated by the, in my opinion, I don't think anybody knows a text better than a translator. Right. You know, there's no closer you can get to actually being inside the writer's head. And in fact, you, you kind of, have to work harder because you're not in, you're not the writer you're not inside the writer's head um uh, and your grandmother did translations too right she did yes I, I wanted to mention that uh, she herself did not know russian uh she oh. worked with her husband avram who was born in russia and uh they to get that's how they met in fact was over uh russian poetry and uh <laughs> She would. Uh, that, makes sense. that makes more sense because she came yeah. from a German Jewish family, right? Yeah, she knew German fairly well and French, uh, I'm fairly well, I think, but she didn't really know Russian. Although they went to Russia, this is interesting. In 1923, he was sent by the New York Public Library to collect books uh, wow. for their Slavonic division, of which he then became the the uh, director. And they spent almost, a, I think, a, a full year in Russia, um, and uh, they attended Lenin's funeral. This oh, wow. Is, wow. This is amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, your your grandfather published a fair number of translations himself. Yes, he, he, yes he did. Um, and uh, biographies and some critical... Yeah. So I'll show, I could see, try to, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'll show you. When I was in in her archive, I'm going to see if I can find it here. Let me, uh, I just need to make you host, I think. Oh, no, I'm going to do it from my phone because I oh, think okay. it's okay, actually. Uh, or maybe it's, uh, here we go. Yeah, it's on my phone. Um, in one of her very many, you know, random um, um files that I, I pulled up a few I wasn't in New York long enough to do it to do a ton of them but I found this interesting image of of a I don't know if that can be clear enough but this is essentially a drawing um in preparation for the dibuk oh wow uh that she photographed, and I believe you can see her fingers there. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Photographing the stuff. Oops! Wow. Um. So these are these are a couple of, and here she says, uh, "N. Altman's designed for a book, never before photographed. Please return to B. Deutsch." <laughs> uh-huh. Um. And this is one of those. And interestingly, here you have it actually says Shema. You have the Shema here, Shema Israel. Whereas if you look at the later stage photos, oops, sorry, it's in the other direction. If you look at the other stage photos, which are also in the archive, it actually it says, um, what does it say? It says something else. But it doesn't say that. These are these are the actual, you know, sort of photos from the from the production. From the production, you can see how close actually the the production wow. was to the drawings. Yeah. There, I I found a couple of images of the drawings online, never from of those images. So that's, you know, she's someone who's clearly very very interesting to look into, um, 
and there's a real eye into this into this period. Um, and also, I just wanted to say, you know, I talked to, I, when, in talking about the book, I talked about Socrates and the story and the meaning of it. But, you know, she just really put you there. And, you know, there were parts in the book where I was I, like, despite I know the story, we know what happens, whatever. But I just was like, I started crying because it's just it's so um, moving. You know, she mm -hmm. she really put I think all of the um complexities of that period into the novel yeah there's one and, thing to ask you about um, and I can't cite the page number but I remember when I first read it she 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 calls one of the conspirators against Socrates um yeah. she calls him a communist um and that yes, was one I anachronism I that I noticed I know. In, the, in the book. It just seemed that that's a word that didn't exist in ancient Greece. Uh, right. uh, but it's there. And uh, I wondered what you made of that. Did you notice that? Very much so. I, I, I very much noticed it. She also mentioned democracy. And I think, I don't, I mean, I haven't, I haven't finished for myself figuring out what that word is doing there. Yeah, um, I'm still pondering exactly what she means it, what she means by it, and exactly how she used it. I think that, you know, there one of the other things I found in her archive is is it a preface to an unpublished intended collection of her, um, of her prose, um, which I would also hope one day to to put together, and um, and in it, the first line of her preface says, you know, the pieces in this. Um, collection were published everywhere from the new masses to the New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And you can just hear all of the, I mean, I just feel like when I read that, that sentence, it is one big middle finger to the 20s and 30s. Right, right. But particularly because in hindsight, we've forgotten oh. that that kind of seamless connection existed. We Last year, we put out a collection by Tess Schlesinger, who was also very radically oriented. And she published stuff in, um, she published things in everywhere from the New Yorker and Vanity Fair to uh, Pagani and, and uh, some of the... Uh, uh, lesser known radical uh, journals that came out in the early 20s i think we or early 30s i think we lost david uh, lost him from the connection um, I, think I'm, um, I think i'm back I lost okay him. great back. welcome okay. again <laughs> here we go so um let's let's open up because we've already gone over the hour but that's a great thing because we've had a great discussion going on here um, if there are uh, folks who have uh, connected in who want to ask questions about the book or make comments, if you've read it, uh, you have questions for David or, or Benjamin, let's uh, let's hear from you, give you an opportunity. Anyone? Okay, well, we don't want to say we didn't give you a chance. I want to, because we're uh, kind of uh, reaching uh, the wrap-up point. But David, just give us a forecast. What's what's uh, what what are we going to see from Lost Classics, uh, or from from uh, uh, Lost Canons in the next uh, six months or so? Let me look at my list because I don't have it all memorized. <laughs> I, no, I no, I no longer have memory. That's one of the things that I lost with. Uh, having little children. <laughs> um, I no longer, I, and I also no longer pretend to have a memory. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you keep. I, I, I have uh, to keep a cheat sheet, and I, we're only doing for a year next year and the next couple of years. Okay. Here we go. It's coming up for me. Um, so, like I said, so we have Fanny Cook. Um, Boot Hill Doctor. Um, we have Grace Lumpkin's The Wedding. Um, 
and also full circle. I hope to put to put together full circle, which is her um, her book about sort of leaving leaving the church, becoming communist, becoming very communist. Um, oh wow! And then and then uh, and then back and then her return. It. And then her return to the church, essentially. So when was um, that published? That was Had to published be early sixties, maybe uh, late fifties, early sixties. Yeah, exactly. Early sixties. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do I w wake or sleep by Isabel Bolton? Oh, thank um, you. I love Isabel Bolton. I am so happy. I've done a lot of research into her. She's such a fascinating story. I don't know. Do you know the whole story about I mean, her and her twin sister? Grace? I don't, but I think I just got the credit for the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I haven't written about that because it's been reissued a number of times in her New York trilogy. Although I think that's an unfortunate way to package those books. Um, exactly, exactly. Um, Which is why I separated it out. Yeah. Oh, I think it's, a, a for, first of all, I think it's by, by far the best of the three. Uh, the best uh, of, yeah. of those. Uh, but yeah, so I, I she, to me, she's a fascinating case. So she was an identical twin. And uh, and her parents died of pneumonia, like within hours of each other when they were quite young. And she and her brother and sister were kind of farmed out to relatives who didn't really want to have to take care of them. But anyway, when she and her sister were about 11 or 12, they were swimming. They were, they'd gone out in a little rowboat in Long Island Sound and the current caught the, her sister and pulled the boat away. And her sister ended up drowning before her eyes. And it was like such a profound, I mean, losing your, she wrote a book later called Under Gemini, which was a memoir about growing up as an identical twin and then losing your sister. And she writes about how they 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 essentially she she spent years not really having a separate identity, but being, you know, part of this uh, tension. So fascinating. She went to New York and she, you know, she never uh, never married, never really connected um uh, uh, it was like a tragedy that just kind of left a scar on her life. Uh, and she tried, you know, she tried children's books. She actually wrote a novel under her own name about that was autobiographical in thy in the days of thy use, I think it's called. Um, and then finally changed her name and published that book. And it, you know, was quite well. I mean, Edwin Wilson went raves about uh, raved about it. So terrific terrific novel i'm so happy to hear that okay so we'll we'll talk after this about about whether you write a preface i'm serious <laughs> that, that, no. i i'm um, not qualified <laughs> no that's I, I disagree um and and then one of the new ones that we that we just put up i don't know if i don't know if you're if i had had if you it was mentioned there but it's called uh the main stem um which is written by someone named william edge and I think that was just interesting to mention. It's just it just did already go up. I'm sure it'll have zero sales ever. But and but part of the reason I think that is because the more I looked into who it was and and after I decided to do it and, and put it through the production, then I was preparing all the background information. Um, the more I became convinced that it was <laughs> ghost written and, and pseudonymously published semi propaganda novel. Um, published by Vanguard Press because this is an author who claims to have a particular history. There's nothing about him anywhere other than this book. Um, and I think that that in itself is an interesting um, mm -hmm. um, exercise to, to kind of also to figure it out and to say, hey, you know, this was also going on. Um, so that's that's what's coming up. And, okay. and, and the archivals and the archivals, which is which is another development. Yeah. Super. Yeah, that's that's great to hear about. Well, I just want to take a moment to let folks know what what we have coming up uh, in the schedule. Um, so I will just a moment here, go back to my. Um, oops. Let me just bring it up here. OK.
the right. Sorry, I got too many windows open. I I'm in the middle of writing a book, and unfortunately, that means I have many, many windows open uh, on a typical moment. So uh, next month, we're going to be talking to uh, another exciting, very much a small operation, Wakefield Press. Uh, does a lot of uh, uh, surrealist and, and kind of odd uh, fiction, and this is, uh, this is a novel from the early 1900s. Uh, surrealistic novel by a Danish writer named Louis Levy. Um, <laughs> I'll have to ask how it gets pronounced, but Krasdok the Onion Man and Spring Fresh Methuselah, which uh, will be fascinating to hear about. Uh, then we also have uh, um, Handheld Press out of the UK, uh, which has been doing a lot of uh, fiction from the 20s and 30s, but this is actually a biography that was published in the 90s and just dis in fact it was self-published in the 90s and utterly disappeared about a woman who was uh early involved in uh the mi5 military intelligence uh secret service in the uk and then was one of the founding uh executives for the bbc uh and then we're wrapping up this year with uh faber who will be bringing out uh, a book called Mistletoe Malice, which is, uh, if you're a Christmas hater, uh, you're going to love this one, um, <laughs> by Kathleen Farrell, who is uh, uh, the partner of a, another writer named Kay Dick uh, for, for years. And then beyond that, for 2024, uh, I'm working with James Morrison, who's uh, who publishes uh, a blog called C Caustic Cover Critic, um, who's probably the best road red guy I I've ever met. Um, and we are going to be looking at wafer thin books. So these are books every month. We're going to be featuring a book, which is on under 120 pages. Uh, and on also inviting folks to talk about uh, examples uh, and enthusiasms. And so there's a special site we've set up called waferthinbooks.com to uh, let folks know about that. And also we're hoping that uh, folks will, share their own um, way for thin enthusiasms. And you're mentioning Louis Adamich reminded me, he's got one himself called Dinner at the White House. Yeah. Uh, which that time, uh, as I'm a big FDR history and biography fan, I'm going to have to uh, dig that one up. I'm sure it qualifies. So it with does. that, uh, it does, but it, uh, just, know. yeah, go ahead. No, no, that does. That does. It'll be, it's an interesting, I mean, I, I, it, it's excerpted in this in the in this collection that I put together oh, of his okay. stuff, but um, which which excerpts most of his book most of his books, um, yeah, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, he thanks very, everybody. He's very heavy at that point. Very, um, he gets very uh, ideologically minded at that point of his career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's probably why the book benefits from. I mean, my suspect dinner at the White House benefits from from brevity. Uh, yes, <laughs> because he, <laughs> yeah, there, there. Are, in fact, uh, I just had an exchange on Twitter with somebody uh, about a, another writer who who published like a dozen pulp novels that were all in the hundred and fifty page ish length, and in my opinion, there's far superior to the serious novels uh, that he wrote because he actually got much worse <laughs> when he stretched out. I mean, there are, there are novelists who benefit from the ability to kind of go off and wonder. I mean, Dickens is like that. Joyce is like that. There are other writers who, who, who the novels are, are enriched by digression. And then there are some where you just say, just shut up and get to the point. Right. So, David, thank you so much for, for joining you, Brad. us and uh, for the discussion. And everybody, uh, everybody else, uh, this will be available on uh, YouTube within the next day. And I encourage you, if you haven't if you haven't read one of the Lost or purchased one of the Lost canons, this is a good one to start with. But uh, it's all re a really exciting list. So I, I uh, wish you the best of luck uh, in this uh, venture. Very much Thanks. needed. Thanks. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye.